Hey guys, Jake from New Age Soldier here. So I made a table for vanilla World of Warcraft, and I added the ability to disable Warden and change a heartbeat interval so I can adjust things like the player movement speed to something like, let's say, 30. Um, I can change falling speed, check where the uh, corpse coordinates are, uh, anti-root, uh, wall climb, take no fall damage, uh, super fly, air swim, all sorts of different stuff. I even added an AOB scan to find the player base for coordinates to be able to teleport if I change any of these XYZ values here, um, as well as other speed variables. Now we made our cheat table, but let's say we want to make an actual trainer program. Um, I'm going to show you how to use the memory.dll uh, library that I submitted to NuGet, which lets you use Visual Studios for it. So I'm going to start a new project from scratch. It's going to be a C Sharp uh, Windows Classic Desktop uh, WinForms app. And here we have our form. So in our form, maybe we would want things like checkboxes or uh, something to set infinite, um, like this active section here, which would lock in uh, movement speed at 30. Um, really, all active means is that it's going to continuously write that. And I'll show you also how to write a script. Uh, C Sharp cannot write ASM. So we have to just view the bytes that are changing in memory view and just note them and uh, change them manually. So let's say I have, we have our form here. I'm going to show you um, the difference between a timer. So here we have a timer. We have a background worker. Way up top here, background worker. Um, and uh, you can do other things like uh, create an async task or really anything to continuously write. I, I personally like background workers just because it's, it's simple to just drag and drop it. So um, let's first create a checkbox. And um, we can do something like say this is to disable warden. I mean, why? I don't know why you'd want that to not be checked, but uh, <laughs> so that's um, if you see here's all the options here, the properties. This is the properties tab. Um, so we'll go under the uh, enabled, and then we'll, uh, which means we're able to check and uncheck that. Um, and checked is what we're looking for. It's right here. Set that to true. And now it's checked. So by default, this will be checked. That'll be to disable warden and heartbeat interval. Um, so we can make another one. And for the disable warden, see we have the text here, but we also have to change the, uh, the label just because it will help us identify whether it's checked or not programmat programmatically. So we do something like that, and now that's the label. And then up here, we'll change this one to the text. Maybe something like that. And we'll change it to heartbeat. So now we have our two checkboxes, and um, Let's go ahead and include the memory.dll within this program. So what we'll do is we'll go to pro, uh, Project, Manage NuGet Packages. Sorry, I'll show you that again. I clicked on that too fast here. Manage NuGet Packages, and you'll click there. And then we'll go to, to Browse, and we'll search for memory.dll and install. OK. And it says it's finished here, so now it's included. It was uh, successfully installed to WinForm App 3. 
So if we go under references, we can see here's memory. Now to view the source code of a WinForm, you can either right click and say view code, press F7. Um, I just like to, you can also double click in the form here, which will bring you to the load section. Um, or you can go over to here where it says form1.cs. So we can right click on that and press view code. And we're in the load section here, <clears throat> which means before the view of this is actually shown is load. So as this application is loading, essentially. Um, so let's, we'll type in using memory, which means we're going to be using it. And down here, we have to create a public mem equals new mem. So now we're using the namespace memory just by simply using the letter M. So if we create that background worker, all we have to do is drag it out and just drop it anywhere within the form. Down here means it's active within this form. So we can double click on it and that will bring us into the do work. If we press M dot, that will pull up all the functions within the memory library. If we wait on it, we can see the actual function and the parameters it takes, as well as a description, because I included an XML description file. So the very first thing we're going to do in a background worker um, is we're going to look for the, well, we have to open up a process. So we know that the process is called uh, WOW. The reason why I know that is because if you go into task manager, under details, we can see way down at the bottom here, it's called wow.exe under details. So, uh, and the process ID number is 59576. We don't include the .exe, it's just called WOW. So we'll go back here, we'll look at our functions, and we're going to look for the open process function. And we can see it takes the parameter of an integer of an ID. Open the PC game process with all security and access rights. ID, you can use the get process, get proc ID from name function to get this. So we can either do something like um, int um, PID equals uh, get, or well, we have to use the M uh, get proc ID from name and string name. So here we can get the process ID number from the pro by the process name. Example, EQ game using uh, task manager to find the name, do not include exe. So we'll use WOW. And it's stored within the very integer variable PID, which we can copy and paste here. And that's it. Um, because it's an integer, it will return zero if there is no process ID found. So if um, the PID is greater than zero, we can open the process. And the process is a Boolean. So I mean, we can just we can just say to open it. But we can also check conditionally, has it been opened? And we can do that by storing a Boolean like um, open proc or something like that. Uh, but we have to declare it as boolean. So bool open proc. Um, and we can say by default it's false. And we can store the open process boolean in the open proc boolean. So now we can say if the open proc which just means, is it true? We can do whatever's in brackets here. And here you can see how there is no brackets that this just assumes, this conditional statement assumes this is what we're talking about here. So do not write continuous code here, 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 and think that this conditional statement is covering everything. It's not, this only covers one more, one additional line. So it's essentially like saying this, if PID ID is greater than uh, zero, then uh, store this in open proc boolean. And then we check the conditional statement. So if I were to comment on this, 
I would say um, get proc ID of game. We can use two backslashes, obviously, for comments. Same in most programming languages. Um, is process open? Try opening process if um, proc ID is greater than one. If process open, um, do code. So if the process is open, we're going to do the code here. And what we're going to be doing is checking if these checkboxes are checked. So we can store um, code in a .ini file, or we can actually just write the code straight in here. Uh, we can write two addresses straight in here by using the m. So we'll call up our name space for memory.dll, and we'll say um, we're going to write memory. And code is our address. So to disable warden is we're just changing these bytes. So what we can do is we can go to that address. So we'll go to memory view, right click, go to address. It's right here, EB. So if we, I'll make sure I don't have anything else uh, checked here. I don't want to get banned in the game. Um, so we'll disable warden, change from EB to 78. So we'll write to the address, and all hexadecimal addresses start with 0x. And the type is a byte, a single byte. And we're going to write uh, 0xeb for enabled. Um, and this is, we're going to check if that checkbox for disable warden, which I called disable warden. So if disable warden dot checked. And that's it. It's just a Boolean. So it just says uh, if it's checked. So here we see Boolean. So if it's checked, we're going to write that uh, byte. And then we can say else. Once again, it's just because I'm writing only one line of code here. Write memory to this address. As a matter of fact, we can just copy it and paste it here. And we can say otherwise write 0x7f. Or four, or no, four. Seven, four, which is uh, warden is not disabled. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. That's a little bit neater. Um, so, yeah, uh, if checked, disable warden. Else, enable warden. And you really never want to do that ever. Um, and we can see if it changed by st starting up the process. We do need to run this program as admin, though. Um, so what we will do is if we uh, right click and press add new item, we go down to application manifest file, add. Now we have an app.manifest file. Um, we can open this, and if we check out the GitHub page, for memory.dll under the wiki, under here, under pages, administrative privileges, we have to change the request execution level element. So here's request execution level uh, as invoker UI access false. We're going to change that to level require administrator. And that's going to make it so when we start up this program, it will ask, it will ask for administrative privileges. So we saved it. And now if we start it, it'll say this task requires the application to have elevated uh, permissions. So restart. 
And now this application is going to have um, elevated privileges. And uh, if we go under the memory here, we have 74, so that's uh, enabled. And we have to first um, start that background worker. So background workers here and uh, with background workers, you can do things like actually uh, create like progress bars and stuff like that. It's really good for uh, downloading files from the Internet and stuff like that. Um, now, the reason why you would want to create a, a background worker or a t um, instead of a timer is because a timer, it, let's say you're infinitely writing. Um, the user interface operates on that same thread. So what's going to happen is you're going to have the user interface elements lock up as the timer is constantly trying to write to that address or constantly trying to open it or whatever it's trying to do. Uh, it'll interrupt the UI thread. So this uh, background worker is on a separate thread so we can move around the user interface freely. Um, and to start up the background worker, let's go into the load and we'll check if um, if the background worker is busy but we're actually gonna say it's not busy so what we do is we put an exclamation or um, yes an exclamation point in the very front um, which is essentially saying is false so if it if the background worker is not busy uh, background worker dot um, we can say run worker async and that will start up the worker. Okay, so now this will only write one time, this background worker, so what we have to do is an infinite loop. So we can say while true, and that just basically means while true is true. <laughs> so it's basically saying like while true equals equals true. So it's an infinite loop and it'll continuously loop through this. Uh, if we press start, and we have disable warden, so if we check out our memory view here we have EB which would be to disable warden and if we go back to our program and we uncheck it it goes back to 74 which is enabled so now it's disabled uh, for the heartbeat interval it would be 500 at that address so we'll just copy the address and change that to so we'll add it here if heartbeat checked and write memory at that address. This will be an integer of one. And then we'll put else. We're going to go back to the default of 500. same sort of thing you can check it really just by just looking at this value if we press start we can see that it's one and by unchecking we're at 500 and now we're at one um, so those are check boxes and that's a background infinite loop background worker infinite loop um, we have the ability to do things like teleport. Um, I'll show you how an AOB scan would work. Here's how you would write it in, C in uh, Cheat Engine. So if we were to search by uh, the exact value array of bytes search, we would come up with that address. If I check it here, takes a little bit, but eventually it finds the address and it fills in the player XYZ. Only reason, some, some games are really good to use this type of thing, like let's say it's a game that patches often, or it has like a GOG and Steam release, those codes are in different places. So you can use things like Array, uh, array of Bytes to find it, but if your game con uh, consistently changes, um, like the player base, it's like every time you move or, <laughs> I mean, like if you die or 
um, you jump into water and jump out, your player base is constantly changing like that, you don't want to constantly do an AOB scan. Uh, so you'd want to actually find the player base. Like here's the player base, for example. Um, and then here's a script to find the player base. But let's say let's say you were actually um, you wanted to use this memory.dll to actually find the player base. So let's just cre I'll create a button. And if I double click on that button, it'll create the click function. Well, actually, it's a click event. So if I, for example, if I click on this button and I go over to here under events, we can see that the click event is button one underscore click. If I double click on there, it'll bring me to the function. So we can do a, a M AOB scan. And we have a start address and a length. So let's say it's always within somewhere near this address, like almost all the time. Let's say it's um, 0, 09, so we can do X, zero, nine, two. So we'll search from 0, 09, to zero A. Um, and what we're going to be searching for is that. Actually, we don't need the quotation marks here. This is a long. So it can take 32-bit um, or 64-bit addresses and we can store this um, actually the result is what we want so at the very end of here result because it's a task and uh, long so we'll create And we can say dot adder to string. And we can say x8. Because we want the um, the hexadecimal value of that. And we can say something like debug dot write. And for example, a debug is something you can use in C sharp, but if we put our cursor over it and go down to uh, show potential fixes, we can using system diagnostics is actually what it is um, using that um, class. So we're going to do that. We're going to say I found the AOB address. Here it is. 0x and then whatever the address is. Um, and uh, at the very end, we'll do an environment new line. So it creates a new line. Uh, so if I press start and I press button one, down here we can see in the output, we have to be under the output tab here, it says uh, debug memory scan is starting and the min is the address and the max is the max that it could scan. And it found the address at here. Um, and right here it ended with, I found the AOB address, here it is, Z uh, zero, um, zero x zero nine nine c zero nine b zero. And if we check cheat engine, that is exactly what the address is, so I found it. Um, like I said, use AOB scans sparingly. Um, it's really nice if you can just scan it one time when a game starts up and then store it in a value. Um, like, if you want to store it in hexadecimal value, um, let's just say string, um, we do have to stop the trainer, string, um, AOB address, um, this is what it would be in a hexadecimal string value, uh, if we want it in integer value, well, it's technically right here, 
It's in long form because um, it supports 64-bit addresses, um, but you can use straight uh, this value. If you were to store it publicly or privately outside of here, so let's say we stored it way up here, public long um, AOB scan adder equals zero, then you can store it there. So we would store this scan result into that. And if you wanted to use it somewhere else, like in our background worker, uh, I would recommend checking if the address is greater than zero, so you know it's a legitimate address, then you can do whatever you want to. You can write um, memory. And uh, because it has to be a string, you can do an AOB scan adder dot to string. And that would convert it to a string. And then the type is whatever. Um, <laughs> let's say it was for health or something like that. We can do integer. Um, and then let's say max address was, or max health was 500. So we can write 500 to the AOB scan found address. And that's it. And that's how you would write to the AOB scan. Um, or you can read it or whatever you want to do with that AOB scan once it's complete. But I'm not going to use AOB scans. I just thought it would be neat to show you guys. So I'll delete the code and we'll backpedal here. When you delete um, a UI element, you will have um, to go back and actually delete the click function. Yeah, because it'll still be there. Do not delete the void, uh, the functions that are connected to UI elements without deleting the element first. Otherwise, you'll cause. Uh, I can actually show you what it would do um, there. And then here's the UI element. And if I were to go over here and say delete the click, and then go back, it would break it. So put it back. Delete the uh, element first, and then delete that. Okay. So now we're back. So let's say we were going to debug. Uh, we can use that debug write to the output, but let's say we actually wanted to show something on here, like if the process was actually open and if it found the process ID. So let's go over to toolbox and uh, I'll just drag out a label. And uh, we can go down here to the text and call it um, while process ID, copy and paste, put it over here. We'll just say pound sign because we're going to be replacing that label. We'll call it uh, proc ID label. And what we'll do is uh, if the process ID is greater than zero, so here we'll, we're going to create more than one line here. So we're going to do um, the proc ID label dot text equals open or equals ID dot to string. So now it'll show the string up here for what the process ID is. And we can also say something like a label. This is purely for debug for the most part. You can show it in a train if you really wanted to. Um, process open. I'm going to copy that label, put another label next to it. Closed. Um, and you can make reference to for color, for example. So that's that's uh, black there. We can do something like red. Say closed. Um, go down here. Open label. Uh, let's call it open label. Um, if the process is open, we can say the. Um, Open label dot text equals 
open. You can say that the open label uh, for color equals color dot uh, green. So we're going to switch to green. Now if we start it up. And if we get something like this, for example, across that upper thread operation is referring to the fact that we're trying to call a UI element from the user interface, which is on a different thread than what the background worker is on. Can happen sometimes. So we're going to stop it. I'm going to invoke it. So we're going to invoke, and it's saying basically the same thing about the open label, and copy that. And there we go. So if we check task manager, I'm guessing it is the correct. What I did for EQ Trainer was I created a drop down box that lets you select the process ID so you could open multiple games. Um, this one's just for debug purposes, but you could fill a drop down box with those um, process ID numbers and you could uh, have them select whichever ones they want to actually cheat from or something like that. And if we go down to it's uh, 8800, and the process is open. Um, so let's say we wanted to do some of these scripts here. Um, it's basically the same method where you would just go to the address that's provided, so wow.exe at that address, and then you would write the bytes that change so if we go to that address same thing go to address paste and here are the bytes before and there are the bytes after so it's only two bytes that are changing here even though the instructions are longer than that it doesn't really matter just in memory view um, ASM can be written in C++ if we inject it uh, but here we're just going to have to write it in bytes, which is really okay. There's um, nothing really wrong with that. Um, so same sort of thing. Um, we just be adding another checkbox. And if we really wanted to, we can actually just change it simply by double clicking on it and the check changed. So that's it. We can actually simply in the checkbox. Um, because things like, um, I'm not sure if disable warden would change or the heartbeat interval would change. Like maybe if we go across zone points, would it actually change back to the default? So this only checks if we've been, if we have uh, clicked or unclicked um, it. And it won't do an infinite write or infinite check of any kind. So in the anti root, let's just say that it doesn't change. Let's say it just writes these changes and then it's just always that way, which is possible. So we'll say the anti-root.check. Uh, 
might as well do an if. Conditional statement anti root dot checked. So if it's checked, we're going to write bytes again. We're actually going to be writing bytes this time instead of byte. So let's write bytes. And uh, it's these two. Copy. Paste them over here. 0x. So we know that they're hexadecimal numbers. Um, that's if it's checked. Uh, actually, no, that should be if it's not checked. Uh, so we can do that. That's and uh, if it's or no, I'm sorry. That actually, yes, that is if it's checked. If it's not checked, it's that. Okay, and then the address right here being wow.exe plus that, we would actually write that like this, simply because wow.exe is the name of the module that's loaded, and we can actually get a list of all the modules within the game. Um, but what I like to do for most games is because if the executable for some reason should ever change, um, if we were to rename the executable or um, I, literally any situation, we can just call it base because technically we're just loading loading from the base address, which as you saw from before when I was doing the AOB scan, if we were to add an address manually and I was to add wow.exe to it, um, you can see here that the address is... 004 and that's uh, the actual address um, so base would be that that's the main module so um, So as you can see, that's assuming that those bytes do not change. Um, so if you're worried about it or something like that, you can put that into the background worker, into a timer, into something that's constantly writing. Um, we can do some other things, like for example, if we don't like that we're able to maximize because there's no real reason for us to have to maximize or be able to drag these sort of windows around or uh, the icon, for example. We can go into the designer and we click on this top bar here and that will give us all the properties of the form. See up here it says properties form one of the form pretty much. So we can change things like the text at the top so we can call this wow vanilla trim and there we go change the title and let's say we don't want to use the icon too that's another option so right here we can change the icon if we want to but I'm going to say show icon false and there we go icon disappeared um, I also don't want the maximize box so now it's disabled uh, we can also change the You can also change topmost. That's a that's an interesting one. That's that way. This is always the topmost window in any situation. The form border style being sizable is the fact that we're able to like grab it from the from the border and be able to drag it in different sizes. So we can say things like fix 3D. As you can see, it also changes the style, too. Fix single. Fix 3D. Fix dialog. So we'll just change it to fix 3D. And when we load it, can't maximize it. 
we don't have a grip on any of the border here. Uh, we don't have the icon, we change the title. We can minimize it and maximize it, or we can close it. And I am using Windows 10, so this is what it, what it would look like in Windows 7. But this is what it looks like in Windows 10, it's different. And if we... You can also do things like changing the cursor, it's pretty weird. So if we were to change the cursor to a cross or something like that, we can load it up and you can see, be a cross. I believe you can also have a custom cursor, I think, too. Not here, but you'd have to do it in code in there. You can also change the like, progress bar style colors and all sorts of different stuff. I would recommend using uh, Google. There's lots of good Stack Overflow. Um, people have asked those types of questions like custom cursors and uh, just changing styles of things that are not necessarily um, within um, the property box here. Um, and if we go way up to the top here where it says Windows Form App 3 Properties, we can see all the information, like for example, the assembly name and the default namespace. We can also change versions here and uh, description, company, product. We can also change what the icon looks like of the program. Um, lots of different options in here. Uh, something that very few people use, I don't know why, but there's actually a settings section in here where you can set settings for um, different form. Um, so you can actually store settings. For example, uh, let's say you wanted it so that way this checkbox, if I were to close it and reopen it, it would be checked every time. Um, so it kind of remembers it and saves it to setting. Um, I can actually show you how that would be done here in settings. If I were to change it to uh, anti-root, so let's just say we called it that, and it's a Boolean uh, scope user. Uh, default value is false, so save. Um, in here, let's say we first uh, loaded up the form load. We would want to load in our settings first. So let's say we wanted to load that setting in, so we would do the anti-root dot checked equals the properties dot settings dot default I don't know why default is in there but it is default um, anti-root which is a boolean so this is going to follow whatever that says now let's say we're closing the application right so let's go under the events section under behavior form is closing if i just double click on it it will fill it in with a default so when uh, form one form closing it created the function for us and well it created the event and everything for us so then we say equals whatever the anti root dot checked says if it's checked or not checked and then we're going to say that the properties dot settings dot default dot save and so we'll save so if we run it and we say check that and then I close it and reopen it it will actually crash because we need to um, be sure that the process is open so we can do something like if it is not open return this function uh, which we actually claim in here so we'll take that out and we'll put it up to the public and now it's checked so if I uncheck it close Start, not checked. If I check it, close, open, it's now checked. So under under those circumstances, actually, you'd probably want to put this actually in there because uh, the checked change will trigger 
on the form load because if it's already checked and the, the form loads in, it says, okay, it changed from whatever the default was. So if the default was not checked and it is checked, it's going to trigger the check change. So I'll put it in there. Simple as that. And uh, this still exists with, oops, within the events. So uh, if we want to, we can go under events and go under here and backspace that. We don't have to delete the UI element, we just have to delete the event. And as you can see, it, just, it deleted it from our code here. So now we have an anti-root and changing the heartbeat and disabling uh, that. And let's say we want to do run speed. Uh, let's see what default run speed actually even is. Or well, it's not run speed, it's actually movement speed. So we'll open the wow.exe. And uh, we actually have to be in game first. They don't want you being AFK for too long in this game. <laughs> so we'll jump back in and the movement speed says zero. It's kind of interesting. Must be a modified movement speed. So if we create a check or uh, a text box, alphabetical order, go to text box, pull it out. Uh, we can do here, and we can say that default value is uh, zero. Let's see, text, we can do zero. And uh, we can say that this is, we can create another label, put it here. That's our movement speed. And uh, for this one, we're going to go in here and we're going to say if the, well, I'm sorry, we actually didn't give it a name. So I'll go back, go back to the text box here, go down to the name, uh, movement speed. And we can just copy that and put it over here. If movement speed, and we have to convert this to an integer, so convert that to, oops, uh, to int. 32 um, is greater than 0. Then we're going to end that write memory to the address movement speed. This has a lot of uh, offsets here. So we're going to copy the base here. Once again, we're going to do the 0x to show that that is a hexadecimal, hexadecimal value, do base plus, and then do a comma for every offset. So offset of 68, 0x68, comma, 0x118, 18. These are all hexadecimal values. an integer and the string we're going to write is movement speed dot to well I'm sorry it actually already is a string or no it's actually text to string all right so if the movement speed in the text box is greater than zero we're gonna write it um, we should also do an additional check here that uh, movement speed is a legitimate number. So we'll make sure that movement speed uh, so null would be blank. So I forgot that's actually a float value. So 
so there we have the movement speed. Actually changing along with the text box there. And so there we have our fast run speed. If we set it to zero, that's normal. Yeah, I assume this is some sort of modified movement speed. It's not it's not the <coughs> it's not the actual base of a movement speed. So that's basically how you would write um, a memory, write to memory. You can also do read if you needed to. So let's say um, you wanted to read to check if something actually wrote. Um, like if you write to do God mode, and then you want to read on the other end to make sure that God mode is enabled, and you can do it on the UI and say like, okay, yep, the God mode is definitely enabled. Um, you can do that. You can do a read, m read memory. Um, so that's pretty much everything that memory.dll has to offer. Um, lots of different options it's in the GitHub. You're welcome to submit any sort of issues you run into. Um, I'm always available in our Discord chat for any sort of uh, ideas that you have, or uh, especially if you would like to release your uh, trainer out to anyone, you're welcome to use memory.dll. Um, it is a free open source library. And uh, yeah, be sure to subscribe for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.